I reckon one of the biggest, most important slash probably the hardest thing to ever do with your personal finances is to get that fully funded emergency fund. You think about it, to be in the position to have a heap of money, even if it's three months worth of expenses, two months worth of expenses, a random number like $20,000 or $15,000, to have that money separate in an account, out of sight, out of mind for emergencies, that's so hard to do because we've all got other financial goals. We might want to buy a house, we might want to save for a wedding, we might want to upgrade the car. You might be struggling to even save any money week on week. So that's why I reckon the emergency fund, it is the hardest thing to do when it comes to personal finances. And it is so important. So what we're going to talk about today is everything to do with an emergency fund. When should you start it? How much do I need? We'll talk about Where do we keep it? What's an emergency? What isn't an emergency? Other considerations? I'll cover it all. And yeah, just let this be an encouragement. And if you are new on the whole personal finance journey, that's okay. Um, You're in great hands. I haven't lost anyone just yet. So let's get into it. My name's Glenn James. We're talking emergency funds. All right, so when should you do the emergency fund? I reckon the answer is right away. If you're an investor in property, if you're an investor in shares, if you're saving up for a house, if you're saving up for a wedding, if you're saving up for a car, if you're just saving money, we need to get an emergency fund. And I'm just going to remind you of the sound financial house that I teach about. So remember this, the roof is the investing, the property, the shares, the walls of the house. They're like your lifestyle goals, and this will change for everyone. The slab of the house is our superannuation and our career. And there's four foundations. The first one is to be cashed up and debt-free. So the cashed up part is an emergency fund, debt-free, no consumer debt. The second foundation is a spending plan. And we'll put a link in the notes if you want to enroll in the Glen James Spending Plan. It's a free course. It will help you get a spending plan in place. The third foundation is insurances. We need life insurance, we need income insurance. And the fourth foundation is wills and estate planning. The reason why we need to really work towards having an emergency fund is because it forms such a strong foundation when it comes to your own personal financial life. If something was to go down and you had invested money and you needed that cash for an emergency, but you had to sell an investment, well, what if the share market was down that week. What if you had a property and you had some equity in the property and there was an emergency and you had to sell that property just to get some cash out to cover a short-term inconvenience? And there are some other benefits of having an emergency fund, which we will get to, but it's just such a strong foundation to have. It will help you sleep at night. It will give you such strong financial confidence It will slow you down with your other goals. And what I mean by that is, if you are starting to build your emergency fund, I want you to focus on this as the first thing to do only. Then you can really start thinking about your financial priorities while that is getting built. And the cool thing is, once you've got your emergency fund, you are done. Like how many people do you think have an emergency fund? I don't reckon there'd be that many. There's been surveys that say, you know, 50% of people or 70% of Americans and all this stuff couldn't come up with $2,000 within a day or two if they needed it in an emergency. Now, luckily, you're listening to this and you are going to start to build your life uh, in the right financial order. So when should you do it? ASAP. So this is what we're going to do. There's two scenarios here. The first scenario is you're in consumer debt and you're trying to get out of consumer debt. You might have some buy now, pay later. You might have some credit cards. You might have some personal loans. You might owe a family member money. If you're in that category trying to get out of debt and you are trying to pay as much as you can off, what I want you to do is put all the debts on minimum repayments only for the next however long it takes to get to $2,000. No extra repayments, no extra money going to different 
you know, prepaying bills and all this stuff with BPay, that could help in the future. But we just need to get you to get a $2,000 emergency fund as soon as possible. And then once we're at the $2,000 amount, if we're still paying our debt, then our financial reason for living is to throw as much money to the debt as possible to get it out of your life. If there is money that comes in, throw it to the debt. If you've got stuff in your garage, throw it to the debt. We've got to sell stuff that we're not using and put all money onto the debt once we've got our $2,000 starter emergency fund. Because a lot of this is about habits and behaviors and we need to start changing those habits and behaviors. So if there is an emergency, and we'll get to a bit of a list later, you don't run to debt, you've got your little starter emergency fund, okay? And then we'll actually talk about what we do when there's an emergency. That's the first column. The next column, you might not have any consumer debt, but you're investing monthly. You might be salary sacrificing to superannuation. You might be, I don't know, saving for a, a house deposit as for an investment property. Whatever you're doing, I want you to stop all investing and focus all that money to be going to your full emergency fund. Now, because you have no consumer debt and you are already investing, I don't know if I want you to sell down investments to fund that emergency fund. I just think you need to stop any future investing and get to that full emergency fund. And we'll get to that in a moment, what I think is a good starting point for a full emergency fund, and then continue your investing. Now, if you've got some investments and they've done really well, like shares or equity, you may decide, well, I want to rebalance my portfolio anyway, take some cash off the table, blah, blah, blah. You might have bought some Bitcoin and that's gone wild again and you are cash heavy. You might make that call to just do a bit of a reset in your financial life, build your emergency fund, then get on with your life. The next category, which I was just thinking about, we've got some debt, no emergency fund, got some investing happening and no emergency fund. The next one is you don't have an emergency fund or any real savings or investing. What I need you to do is really lean into your personal budget and make sure you're optimizing everything that you've got. It's really tough out there at the moment, um, but I just want you to make sure that you can get as micro as possible with your budget so we can start to save some money. And even if you put $2,000 as an initial target, just to take any pressure off that I need thousands and thousands of dollars, we just need to get you to have a cash buffer uh, happening. Now, if you've already got some cash savings and you've got, I'll make a number up, you've been saving really hard, $30,000, and we're going to put that towards a house. Look, I think you still need to slow down and have an emergency fund before you buy a house. Why would you want the most fun time in your life, the most exciting time in your life to put you back to living on the line? You know what I mean? Like you've got this house, you've got this property when you get it, but moving into that property, you've opened yourself up to a whole heap of other emergencies that you don't have to fund right now if you're renting so I reckon there's a strong argument to slow down on your investing strategy or buying your first property and get that emergency fund rock solid and then keep going. And that could delay the thing by a year or so, all right? Can you work harder or work side hustles, do overtime, all that stuff for a couple of months to build the emergency fund? I don't know, but I just know all the times that I've read where people and they've had emergency funds it saved their asses and it's taken a whole heap of financial stress off, okay? So we need to get an emergency fund ASAP. How much to keep in your emergency fund? Well, as a starter, we need to get to $2,000, then we pay off our debt, then we need to go back and look at our expenses. And I believe we need three to six months worth of expenses. Now, what are not expenses? savings each week, all right? You might be saving $200 a week. Don't factor that in because that's just extra, right? You might be putting more money into superannuation, salary sacrifice, that's not an expense. Any money that you're investing long-term, that's not an expense because if there was an emergency, you can actually press pause on this stuff and if you didn't actually keep investing, the show isn't over. But rent, mortgage repayments, utilities, 
uh, your car loan, if you've got a car loan, uh, any medical medication, groceries, anything that you have as an expense in your life needs to be allocated as part of that three months worth of expenses. And that's after tax. Now, you might make the view that, well, we spend, and I'll, again, I'll just make some numbers up, we spend $100 a week on the gym. You may decide if we did have a big emergency, I'm happy to just to stop some of these luxuries and cut that out for a period of time. Not sure. I kind of think, and particularly in the Glenn James spending plan, and again, there's a link down below that you can click and download. The spreadsheet that I've got, like the first tab, and thanks to all those who have done this, and it's no cost, so you can download it. The first tab, you put all your income in. The second tab, you put all your expenses in. And this includes like gifts, Christmas, birthdays. And then the third tab will actually tell you what I believe your target emergency fund is. But it won't include stuff like gifts. It won't include Christmas presents. It won't include savings. So that will give you a really good way to, to work that out. Now, three months of expenses, you might get to the point where it comes to $11,115. You might go, okay, we'll just call it 10 grand. Knock yourself out. We'll call it 12 grand. We'll call it 11 grand. We'll just round it to 15. Whatever that is, like, I don't know, and it's a personality thing, like if I did it and it was $11,115, I'm probably just going, yeah, I'll call it 12 grand, or yeah, I'll call it 11, like just round it off. The thing is, we just need some type of buffer and some type of science behind that number, and then we, we get on with it. So what is not an emergency? Well, so many things. I mean, uh, it's an emergency when I wanna buy a new speaker for my lounge room, am I right? Get a new Sonos subwoofer, that's an emergency. Need it now, wrong, that's not an emergency. New clothes are not emergencies. A new car isn't an emergency. A new lounge, a holiday. You want to buy lunch today. That's not an emergency. I reckon anything that you can plan for that will come up on an annual basis, like categorically, in your budget is not an emergency. Car rego isn't an emergency. Christmas presents are not emergencies. Christmas is on the same day every year and it has been for many, many years. So what am I getting at? And here's actually, here's an example. I allocate in my spreadsheet, I think maybe three to 500 a year on dental treatment. Because what I do, I go in every six months and the first time I get, like we'll just say the first batch of six months of the year, it's a clean only. When I go back in six months, it's a clean and a dental checkup with the dentist. So the every time I see the hygienist, every second time I see the dentist for a checkup. So I factor in that cost, the net cost to me from uh, my health fund. And I think I end up paying like $180 or something like that, right? Per visit on average. So I factor in say three to $500 a year in my budget. Now, if I, cause someone asked this in the Facebook group the other day, they said, oh, you know, I've got my budget and all that. I had a tooth issue or a dental thing that came up that was above the routine stuff. Is that an emergency? And I'm like, yes, it is. Because we don't plan throughout the year in the, the dental line item, routine checkups, and then $300 just in case. There's just no need to do that because we want our cash flow and our budget to be as lean and as agile as possible. Anything that comes up out of the blue can come out of the emergency fund. So anything that we can plan for that's regular is not an emergency. There is no such thing as an out of the blue bill generally, unless you bloody hit someone and they send you a repair bill because you weren't insured or something like that. Like that's an emergency because in my budget, I don't plan for accidental bills throughout the year, right? So just cause you want it, holidays, lounges, new cars, headphones, all that stuff, these are not emergencies. What is an emergency? So I've just written down a couple of things here that could help you in determining what an emergency is. Car insurance excess. So you may have hit somebody and you know there's damage and you have to pay an excess of you know $800 to $1,000, whatever that is. 
you may have to pay in excess of $800 to $1,000. And like the dental analogy, in our budget and in our line items, we've got an annual cost for insurance, but we don't have an annual line item and allocation for insurance excesses, okay? That's an emergency. Major car breakdowns, you know, needing towing and repairs. When I get my car serviced every 15,000 kilometers and it's a million dollars because everything's expensive these days, that stuff is an emergency because I've got an idea that I need $700 a year making a number up for car services. Likewise, new tires are not an emergency. I'm saving for that stuff throughout the years. But if the gearbox shats itself and it's $2,500 or $3,000 for a rebuild, guess what? Ta-da, emergency. So things that are out of the blue that we don't plan for are emergencies. A hot water system stops working and it needs replacement. That's an emergency. A sudden pet emergency not covered by insurance. That's an emergency. Child sickness, you know, if something came out of the blue and you needed to buy a, I don't know, a, you know, those ventilator things or I don't know, stuff for kids. <laughs> You, you know, that's not planful throughout the year. Like, oh, they're sick and a ventilator in the room at night. Like, sure, emergency. We didn't plan for that. We didn't have the cash anywhere else, you know, and I'll talk about it later, but the money's got to come from somewhere. A close family member in another state dies and you need to buy flights to attend the funeral. I'm going to call that an emergency. Uh, and then what else is an emergency? Anything that you do not budget for within your spending plan. So it's, it's kind of really simple in my world, how I define an emergency. Anything I don't budget for or shouldn't budget for, what is not an emergency, stuff that I know will happen categorically throughout the year or every 18 months. Simple as that. And it might take a while to get into a bit of a rhythm with your budget and cash flow, particularly if you are a new homeowner. You know, dropping $400 of Bunnings on random crap for your yard is not an emergency. Feels like it when you're there, you got the trolley, I've got my watering can, I've got my, my bag of soil, I've got my little pot plants. This stuff isn't an emergency. It's fun, but it's not an emergency. We've covered when you need to start the emergency fund, how much you should aim to have in the emergency fund, and I think three months worth of expenses is a really good starting point. What's not an emergency, what is an emergency? So where do we keep our emergency fund? Okay, let's talk about first, where we do not want to keep our emergency fund. And we'll just use the example that someone's emergency fund is $12,000, all right? Number one, we do not want to keep it in physical cash at home. We don't want it under the bed. We don't want it anywhere. I don't even think, like, sure, if you, you've got a safe, you might keep a couple of grand in there cash just in case, but realistically, it needs to, you know, be put to work or at least earning some money and take the risk away of uh, theft or damage, uh, fire or flood and all that stuff. Not that I think money can be flood damage, but you, you vibe me. So we don't want to keep it in cash. The next thing, we don't want to keep that money invested because remember when it comes to investing, we only invest money that we don't need to touch for at least five to seven years plus. So it doesn't make any sense to invest money into a even Australian 200 index. And then if there's an emergency, even though we can sell it down, you may trigger a tax event that you don't need. You may be selling at a loss. You may want to try and time the market. And no, no, we just need to grab the money and pay for the emergency, get on with our life. We don't definitely want to contribute more to super and keep the emergency fund in super because you can't touch your super. And that would be considered um, invested anyway. We don't want to keep it in a term deposit or a fixed term deposit. And these aren't really that popular these days, but term deposit, um, $12,000 locked away for six months, slightly higher interest rate. You might get interest paid monthly, or if it's a yearly term deposit, it might be every six months or whatever that is. We don't want to do that because if there's an emergency and we have to break the term deposit, there could be interest penalties. We don't want that. I would also say we do not want it in the same account as other savings. We wanna keep things clean so we know that it's separate away from all your day-to-day -day stuff. 
we don't want to keep it in a holiday account. It's like, oh, that's my little holiday fund and I've got my emergency fund in there and my savings for this. I mean, sure, there are freaks out there and you've got your spreadsheet and you've got, you know, $31,500 in your bank account and you've got your spreadsheet and you're an engineer and you can be like, all right, 12,000 is an emergency and this is for this and that's for that. That's fine. You're not like most people. So when I talk about this stuff, I'm saying what's best practice for the general population. And so what I really believe is your emergency fund needs to be in a separate quarantined account. Now, that account could be an online savings account, which pays a higher interest than a transactional account. Another way to do this, and this is how I personally do mine, uh, I've got an investment property and that property has an offset facility and I've got my emergency fund in that offset account. Now that property is with its own separate lender from my other properties and my other daily banking. And I've chosen that property because of the property portfolio, that mortgage has the highest interest rate. So that's where my emergency fund is sitting. It's in a separate bank that I don't use for anything else. And it is over there, out of sight, out of mind, but I know it's there. I don't recommend we use redraw facilities for an emergency fund. A couple of reasons, because you may get tempted to one, see it every time you open your internet banking and you're seeing, oh, I'm in credit, oh, I might need to buy in this new lounge and oh, we can justify it and emotionally manipulate your own situation to make it that new lounge is an emergency where we do have visitors coming in. Yeah, buy a new sheet and throw over the lounge, I don't know. Um, and then during COVID, and this is like a real one percenter, uh, there were some really old bank products that said any money in the redraw, um, the bank can you know absorb that and apply it to the loan and dig around with the redraw facility. So a couple of reasons, the bank risk isn't a big one. I think it is more that it's not necessarily quarantined and you might be tempted more to, to touch it. So realistically in my world, keeping an emergency fund, it's an online savings account with another bank or institution just so you don't see it day in, day out. That's where mine is. Or if you do have a mortgage with an offset facility, create another account that is offset and put it in there. It is okay if you've got a vanilla mortgage and you're just paying monthly payments to that. It is okay to have your emergency fund in another bank account out of sight, out of mind. And I'll grab my calculator here and people are like, oh, well, don't we want to like um, make sure that it's earning money? No, no, the emergency fund there, it's an insurance policy. And I'll tell you how much you pay for your own emergency fund insurance policy. So if you had a mortgage with 6.5% interest, right? And we didn't want to use the redraw because it muddies the water. And we'll just say $12,000 times 6.5%. So that's $780 a year, right? If we had it on the regional facility. So effectively, we're not paying $780 in interest. But if we had that $12,000 in an online savings account, and we'll just say getting 4.5%, that's $540. Take away the $780. So realistically, the $240 amount, which is the difference between what you would not pay on your offset and what you would get if you had the money in a savings account that isn't the offset, that $240, I reckon, uh, the difference, because we'll get 540 interest, the 240 is your insurance premium, if that makes sense. So, you know, we can split hairs about all this stuff, but just have a bloody emergency fund, out of sight, out of mind, move on with your life. Simple as that. You want your financial life to be so uncomplicated and easy, like do what you want, like number one, don't care, but I don't know, I just, <laughs> don't overcook it, that's all I'm saying. They're really, I think, the two best practice options. Separate online savings account with a different bank or lender, out of sight, out of mind, or that offset account with a separate thing. So one of my other properties, uh, there's an offset account, and I can have multiple offset accounts. Um, I had an offset account for my cash hub, I had an offset account for my uh, Christmas clothes, holidays, gifts. I had an offset account for P 
PAYG tax and I had an offset account for an emergency fund. Sure, I could see it every time I went in there, but it was quarantined. I don't actually see my emergency fund now at all. So what do we do if we have an emergency? I reckon, and this is what I see in, in our Facebook group, we've got to learn that it's okay to use your emergency fund if you have an emergency, because that's what the money's there for. You've put it aside for such a time when there's an emergency. Simple as that. It's okay to use it. Now, what I would do, and we'll use the scenario, I chip my tooth and I need... Oh, actually, here's one. I've got a little baby tooth here, right? I've, yeah, it's still a little baby tooth at the bottom. There's no tooth under it. Now, they've told me that one day that baby tooth will likely come out. It's really healthy, you've got good roots at the moment. And I will likely need a dental implant. Now, if you know anything about dental implants, I'm probably looking at $7,000, all right? So what I've decided, because it is something I'll need to do in the future, and that isn't on the horizon at the moment, I'm not saving for it at the moment, okay? If I bit down on something and it wrecked this baby tooth and they're like, oh, we, you chipped the baby tooth. Hey, there's no point spending $1,000 on fixing it. We think you need to just rip the bastard out now and get an implant. Because that kind of happens sooner than, you know, three or five years or, you know, 10 years down the track. Yeah, I'd use $7,000 out of my emergency fund. Done. Now... What I would then do is I would pause all my other investing. So at the moment, I invest in shares, an investment bond every month. Every month, money leaves my account and goes into equity investing, dollar cost averaging, rinse and repeat. If I bit down and it was a $7,000 tooth job that was you know, all of a sudden and had to get the implant, I would pause all my investing. Then I would put that money that I was investing to build up the emergency fund back to my target amount of what it was. And then I would resume investing. If you are trying to get out of debt and you've got a $2,000 a $2, starter emergency fund, I would probably, you know, if you had to pay $500 for a smash window or something at your house and the excess was 800 and the window was just 500, pay the $500 while you're still getting out of debt, pause all additional debt repayments and then put all that money back towards the emergency fund. Then when that gets, when that gets back to $2,000, then continue um, the debt payment um, campaign. So that's basically what you do when you have an emergency. So other considerations uh, would be if you're self-employed. So you might be a contractor and or a consultant, have your own business. I reckon it could be wise to have an emergency fund of up to six months because what I found being self-employed myself, it's like you wake up every day without a job basically. <laughs> And you, you get used to it because it's a risk profile thing and you know risk tolerance to, to working for yourself. But I really believe that when you're a small business owner, having that comfort and security will 100% allow you to have less stress in the business and therefore make you a better business person. Like as simple as that, 100%. So there's that portion of the emergency fund. The other side of it is if you have a couple of weeks, a couple of months without income, or if you're waiting for a job, you need to make sure that you can use some of that emergency fund up to six months to replace your actual income. Where if you're an employee, the emergency fund of three months is really like realistically for the big lumpy things. And there are some other considerations when you've um, got the full fund. But yeah, I, I just think as a self-employed person, have six months worth of expenses. Now, having said that, 
you might want to have a higher emergency fund than three to six months worth of expenses. And I would say, look, that's fine, but I'd really ask you why. Now, for me, I think my emergency fund is, gosh, I think it's a year's worth of my net income. So it's it's really big. And I've just decided I want it to be that big because it gives me that extra comfort level and I am doing mother investing and, and things are good. But if it was really big based out of some weird thing and you had lots of money, like the cash needs to go to work. So it is a, it's, it is a dance of like, why have you got a $50,000 emergency fund when you're an employee with a government job, you've got six months worth of long service or holidays or sick pays or whatever, and you're crying because you don't have a spare $15,000 for a new car because you've got a piece of crap. Like, you, your emergency fund doesn't need to be that big. It's, it's borderline, you probably need to get some counseling because there's an underlying fear there potentially because the facts say you've got a full-time job, yeah, it's a very secure government job. You've got really good employment benefits. You've got your income protection insurance. You categorically don't need the $50,000 emergency fund. And again, I'm prefacing this with do what you want, but you vibe me. What do you do when you've got a full fund? Well, this is the cool thing. And having a full emergency fund, it could be, as I said at the top, like it could be the biggest thing that you'll ever do financially, the biggest first thing, because having all that money just aside, it's a very privileged thing because a lot of people can't get there and I reckon you can get there. So I reckon once you get there, I'm pausing and I'm flipping celebrating because it's such a big thing. Then what I want you to do is review some other areas in your budget and I'll give you an example. Because we've got that emergency fund and hypothetically that $12,000, the difference between the offset interest and the uh, interest that we're earning, and this is gross before tax, so go easy on me. The $240 premium for your emergency fund, if you will, we can use that to self-insure some other things. So if you've got a 30-day wait on your income protection, well, now you've got three months worth of your own expenses, knock that to a 90-day waiting period and self-insure the first three months. It will make the insurance premiums cheaper. You might increase your home excess a little bit higher because you've got an emergency fund, which will make your ongoing insurance cheaper. You might increase your private health insurance excess to make the ongoing a bit cheaper because you're self-insuring the first thing. So that's the real cool thing. You might have a, a pet that you have pet insurance for and you might decide now that you've got an emergency fund, we'll just take the risk ourselves. Now, I've actually resolved, if I get a doggy or a caddy, Pet insurance, it's an interesting thing. I've just resolved that I'll probably, because uh, it's so cheap, you just get it and get on with your life, but they don't cover 100% of the costs. Yeah, I've kind of oscillated like whether I get pet insurance or not, but I don't know why, because I'm not getting a pet tomorrow. But yeah, you might decide to cancel the pet insurance uh, and just self-insure. So what other things can you sell? Your car insurance, can you increase the excess? So a heap of these insurances, we can increase the excess because we're going to self fund a whole heap of stuff and this will make your annual expenses lower. Rich get richer, baby. Well, I might leave it there. I hope that's been encouraging for you. And I'll just open Instagram because I did put a post up and asked people if they've got any questions about emergency funds. Why do I feel like I never have enough? Once I hit four months expenses, I feel I need to hit, ex I need to hit six, etc. Yeah. So Based on that, Kate, it kind of goes back to the psychological dance of it, where for me, I'm investing lots every month. Um, I've got my business. Things are good financially. For the psychological factor of I just want a big emergency fund because I employ seven people and I just need to make sure that if the shat hit the fan, I can still make payroll. So for me, it's an actual comfort level. And I'm okay with that. And what I'd say to you, Kate, is try and get some accurate data on the table. Do you actually need six months? You might not. But it gets to that point where it's just like, get a number and stick to it. If it, if it comes down to 17,600, 
Just go, all right, I'm just aiming for 20 grand and then I'm done. Because life's full of risks. You can't insure everything or spend all your money on insurance and you have to take a risk. And that's the same with our emergency fund. You might have a $15,000 emergency fund and there's a flipping big emergency that comes in that's 25 grand. It'd be very rare for that to happen, but life is full of risks. You cannot remove any risk out of your life unless you're dead. It's like as long as you're living, there are risks in your financial life. We can mitigate risks, we can understand risks, but we can't remove them completely. So yeah, done know, okay. <laughs> Run lift punk. Best kept in a separate savings account, earning taxable interest or in your offset. Well, and that's kind of what I went back to. Like I would keep it on offset if it was in a separate account. I wouldn't mesh it or mix it with other money. Otherwise, I'll keep it in a separate account, out of sight, out of mind, not earn the $240 a year and call that the insurance premium to keep it out of sight, out of mind. Because that money's worth it. The loss of interest earned is worth it if it keeps you not spending it on frivolous things or losing track of how much money you've got and, oh, we've got a holiday coming up and, oh, we've been saving it all on our offset and we've pulled that out and you might look at the data and you might be $6,000 under your emergency fund just because you've lost track of everything. So look, there's a heap of other questions, but I've actually answered all of them in today's um, episode. So thank you so much for having a listen. Remember the Glenn James Spending Plan, it's a free online course. Uh, There is no cost to do it. I will tell you how much you need in your emergency fund. I'll tell you how much to put in what account every single week, and I will remove financial stress from your life. My name's Glenn James. Thank you so much for listening. Bye.